We are in a series entitled Justified, and we're walking through the book of Romans, and I, I hope you're enjoying this. I hope you're able to let the word of God speak. It's relevant. It's powerful. Uh, it's described as a two-edged sword cutting asunder soul and spirit. In other words, it can, it, can, it can actually help shape who you are. It's a surgeon's scalpel for the Holy Spirit, and it's a, it's a weapon of warfare for you to be able to live the way God wants you to live. So we're, I'm hoping you're getting something from it. Now, there is this reoccurring theme we're going to see in the book of Romans. It's going to be really apparent once again as we read our text this morning. And it is the God that Paul wants us to know what it means to be right with God. And he's going to drive this home time and time again. His, idea, his, 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 his whole purpose in this is that we need to have a right theology. What we think about God is the most important thought we'll ever think. Uh, it, how we view God and how we understand Scripture and what the Bible teaches about humanity, we must get these things right. Last two weeks ago, actually, we were in verses 5 through 11, and Paul talked about some of the benefits of being a Christ follower, that we get to know the love of God. Verse 8 says, God demonstrated his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Come on. His love demonstrated towards us. I mean, he showed us his love even as we were still sinners. And uh, earlier in that, we learned of other benefits that God has given us in verses 1 through 5. So now Paul is saying, with this in mind, we must understand the challenges that are before us. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Romans 5, chapter 12. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Romans 5, verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. For everyone, what? Sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. In other words, death still reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God, as Adam did, they still die. I'm paraphrasing there, but that's what he's saying. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. Verse 15. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift to, for, of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Verse 16, and the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Verse 17, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule, say rule, over many but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it. They will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Verse 19, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. One disobeyed, one obeyed. Verse 20, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. How many can say, thank God? Verse 21, so just as sin ruled, there's that word ruled again, ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, hallelujah, giving us right relationship, right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot there, and uh, it's powerful. 
And Lord, your servant Paul takes us through this juxtaposing of Adam and your son. Lord, I ask you to speak to us. Help us understand what you want us to do with this. What can we learn from this? What should we rest in because of this? And what should we address in our personal lives? We love you, God. We give you praise. We give you honor. And all of God's people agreed. And they said? Amen. Come on, Beatrice, say it again. Everybody say? Amen. Amen. That means so be it. So be it. So here's a couple questions for you. What makes you, you? Who are you? I'm, I'm seriously wanting you just to kind of think about that in your own head. Who are you? Where did you come from? What are your passions? What are your skills? What defines you? What are you allowing to be that which you identify with? History giving, man, is key to any genuine relationship or friendship. If you want to get to know someone, you need to ask questions like that. But to be able to ask them, you most likely need to be familiar with answering them yourselves. But as we grow in relationships, understanding one's history is crucial. Like, where did you grow up? What makes you, you? Our past heritage, family upbringing, life circumstances, education, national origin, and friendships all contribute to who we are. And in truth, our history plays a big part of who we have all become. Now, I'm a good example of this because I have a huge passion. How many of you, let me just ask this before I even say this. How many of you have a fear of speaking in front of other people? Raise your hand. Be honest. Look, at, I love that we're in an honest church. Yeah, come on, all around our campuses. Yeah, you have a fear of speaking in front of people. Do you know that I have a real compassion for you? Um, matter of fact, I, I would say I'd go even farther. I have a real burden for people who wrestle with insecurities when it comes to what people think of them or they're insecure of, of maybe how they, they present themselves when they're in front of others. And the reason for that is because when I was in elementary, and some of you know this part of me, I stuttered. And my, I had a big issue with that. And my folks uh, had to take me actually to professional um, to work with some professionals to somehow to help me with my stuttering, my stammering. But because of that stammering, I had this, this deep fear of speaking in front of people and afraid of rejection and uh, self-conscious of whether or not I was making sense. And so because of that history, my origin story, I now have a real burden for people or a compassion for people that are fearful of speaking in public or have difficulty when it comes to the fear of man. I get it. I understand it. And you say, yeah, but Rick, you're a preacher. But that's also part of my story because God freed me from that fear. God has done a work in my life. Isn't it cool? He makes a stuttering, stammering child a preacher. That's ridiculous. It's almost fun. It is. It's funny. It's like, whoa. And so... Our history, our history makes a difference. So how about you? I mean, what's your burdens in life? What, what, what's come, what has happened in your past that makes you passionate about what you are today? What's your, what, what was your family like? And how did your family or lack of family impact you? As a, when I was a youth pastor, man, I was a youth pastor for many years. I can't, I can't tell you the, the devastation so many te teenagers were wrestling with because of of their home life. And many of you understand that. Or I'd ask you this, what was your church experience growing up? You know, if you've ever been bullied, that's influenced you and your perception of authorities. What makes you, you? See, the only way to get to know yourself, let alone get to know someone else, is to understand your own origin history, your own sense of where you have come from. I would go so far as to say that the only way for you to understand yourself is to look at your own history. And this is what the Apostle Paul is doing with us in this, this passage we just read. I, I hope you see that. 
He's bringing up these two great archetypes of humanity, Adam and Jesus. Both of these men play a role in all of our lives. See, our history, as I said earlier, plays a big part of who we have become. And, and, and probably no greater influence have been these two archetypes of humanity. How you respond to either of these men will determine whether or not you become part of history or you make history. And so it is, we look at this juxtaposing that Paul is doing. He's comparing Adam with Jesus. He's contrasting Adam with Jesus. And, and what we kind of miss, because we don't have a Hebrew background or we weren't in the early church where it was established by Jews, is we miss in the backdrop Genesis chapter 3, which is the fall of humanity. It's the account where Adam and Eve eat of the fruit that was forbidden from a tree they were told not to eat from. And from that disobedience of one man brought the fall of all humanity. And Paul is using this backdrop to help us understand this origin story has created an issue. He's given us this high definition picture of our personal nature's present an impending doom. It all started with Adam's disobedience. So here's what I want to do. This is not necessarily like a yippy-skippy kind of passage. But it's so crucial to your theology. It's so crucial to your understanding of society, even politics. I, I was talking to a Christian uh, not that long ago that really believes that we can... We can make the world better through institutions and political organizations. And, I, and don't get me wrong, I think we need to use uh, government and political institutions and the processes to try to better the world. But we quickly found ourselves at differences. He believed that at the heart of a person is a goodness, a purity. And my understanding of theology is that the heart is deceitfully wicked. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That no matter how great one's intentions, brokenness still follows within our systems and our organizations. I'm grateful for a country that understood this. So they created a system of checks and balances. They understood how power corrupts. But power doesn't corrupt in a vacuum. Power corrupts because there has been a human falling. There has been a brokenness to humanity from the start. We have to understand that. If we don't have that lens, then we begin to interpret things and think through our own actions, we can bring this significant change. And I'm going to tell you right now that ultimately, if you want to change history, you want your origin story to begin with Jesus. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the contrast. You with me? Say amen. amen. Let's look at what we get from Adam. I'll tell you what we get from Adam. We get this idea that life isn't fair. I was talking to Garrett, young man who was a very up-and-coming UNL gymnast, was in a car wreck, I want to say 10 years ago, changed his life forever, trajectory. Uh, he can't do gymnastics. He has some battles. His dad recently has cancer, life isn't fair. It's a truth. We just lost someone last week from our Christ Place family, and the week before that, someone else. Both were significant members and contributors in our church. They loved people. They invested in our church. They invested in our communities. Life isn't fair. And then we have, to, we have only to look at our own origin story to understand that because, because Adam set us all up for failure. And that doesn't feel fair, does it? It just doesn't. Matter of fact, when I look at my front row here, I, I mean, life isn't fair. Jonathan can drive a golf ball way farther than I can. You know, Pastor Landon can shoot a basketball better than me. 
I mean, you look at, you just, just, I'm looking around here. Man, if I was half as good looking as some of you. I mean, life isn't fair. It's just not. But to a greater extent, man, Adam set us up for a failure. Verse 12 says, because Adam sinned, it brought death and it spread to everyone. Folks, that's not fair. When Adam sinned, death entered the world. Death, by the way, you must understand, is not just physical. It's spiritual and it's moral. That when Adam sinned, it became like an uncontrollable virus. What happened to our pandemic? We reacted. We shut our lives down. We withdrew. We isolated. What happened in the garden when Adam and Eve, they took of that one thing. God offered them everything. It's the one thing we can't have. They disobeyed. And what happened? They felt shame. And it says they withdrew. And God walks through the garden in the cool of the day. And he says, Adam, where are you? Not that he doesn't know where Adam is, but that, Adam, why aren't you where you are always at when we meet and we commune? Why have you isolated yourself, Adam? There is this, this part of us that will always withdraw now, this part of us that sin will always try to isolate us or cause division amongst us. It's part of the nature of death. It breaks relationships. Our world now is broken and rife with injustice and inequality and poverty. Bad things happen to good people. And we live in a world that has rebelled against God. And we say life isn't fair. Yeah, but, but here's the thing you must understand. For life to be completely fair, your free will would have to be removed. And before we become self-righteous and assume if we had been the first Adam, life would be different. Mm -mm, not so fast, my friend. I would be so bold as to suggest the world would be no better off. Because there isn't a one of us in the house that hasn't been about ourself at some point and our own self-preservation. There's not one of us can say, well, I'm better than Adam. I'm better than Eve. See, God valued our ability to choose. And therefore, he gave us that ability to fall. See, not long after the fall of Adam and Eve, this is crazy. Cain kills his own brother out of guilt and jealousy towards God. Not guilt and jealousy over a woman. Not guilt and jealousy over success. But over one's relationship with God. Talk about brokenness. Even early on, we see how religion outside of right relationship actually divides. The human heart, my friends, is capable of great evil. You heard of the killing fields through our missionaries who are here at Old Cheney. They are missionaries of Cambodia. I was there. The atrocities, if you've ever visited um, where the Holocaust has, had took place during World War II, you understand the human heart is capable of such great evil. And you would do well to not assume it isn't you. In truth, Adam is no more guilty for his poor choices than we are of ours. And I'll tell you, part of the beauty and the irony of this is you did nothing to make Adam sin, but then again, you did nothing to get Jesus to love you. So while I, Adam has left this world rife with injustice, Jesus, I love this part. Here's a contrast. Jesus has taken our lives and infused it with hope. Come on, somebody. Life isn't fair, but the Holy Spirit has a way of bringing you hope and peace that supersedes circumstances and people that you have no control over. I mean, I love how Paul talks about how, how yes, sin brings death and death through this obedience um, uh, makes us very much divided from God, uh, away from God. And yet Jesus gives us righteousness, his righteousness, so that we can, we can actually begin to see ourselves being different than how we were pre-Christ. Hope becomes this anchor in our life. And we can take, you can take it to the bank. That God will make all things right, if not on this side of eternity, then on the other side of eternity. 
Why? Because our God is just. Our God is loving. And he has your back. God wants to infuse our lives with hope. If you've ever been to a third world country, you know what I'm talking about. You visit Christians. And and it's crazy, man, the the joy and the peace and the hope that they're filled with. They They have so much less than us. They have less money. They have less toys. They have, they have less, less entertainment, less opportunities, less power of influence in their government, less privileges, and yet they're filled with immense hope and joy. Why? Because our current life, though, yes, um, the, 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 through Adam, it has, it has been fallen and broken. Christ has a way of infusing hope and rising you above your circumstances and your situations. Your quality of life doesn't dictate how happy you are. Come on. While we should work to restore creation, equality, and fairness, we should not miss the invisible arm of God's kingdom ruling and reigning over people's circumstances, over your circumstances. See, Jesus wants to lift us from the muck and the mire of life's injustices, inequities, and give us hope. Folks, that's an anchor to the soul. I hope you know what that's like. So in this fallen world, this background of Genesis, humanity has fallen. Life isn't fair. And we can just live in that realm. And it is what it is. and, 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 And have a pity party. Or we can allow Christ to infuse hope in us and no justice will reign either now or later. We can change what we can change and we can leave the unchangeable in his hands and have a peace. Come on. Right? But Adam, in this infamous, infamous time, not only did he disobey God and it bring death, a part of that death has to do with our human nature. Have you ever wondered why babies bite? Why babies will so quickly learn to say no be some of the first words in their vocabulary. Do you know I never taught my daughter to push, to push children over? I didn't like, hey, Kato, watch me push Rich over, you know. Never. How did she even want to do that? Within our nature now, because of death, because of sin, it's in them. It's tainted the image of God. It's tarnished who we are created to be. See, from Adam, and this is something, this is part of what Paul's driving home. Our human nature is bent. Verse 14, we're told that death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though there was no law to point it out. In other words, death kept ruling, which means sin ruled. For the wages of sin is death. So sin was still ruling. Though there was no law to declare that people were walking in sin, they still were ruled by it. Since the fall of Adam, our nature has a bent towards sin. It's in us. It's just not, it's just not the things we do that are sinful. It's not just the things that we don't do that we should do that create sin. It's our nature. It's our nature. There's a beast within us that resists our creator's intent. There's a battle for our minds and a war within our souls. And know this, my friend. No amount of nurture can eliminate your nature. (laughs) We live in a world that thinks if we just get the nurture right with education, with proper parenting, if we just get the nurture the right, if we just get all the right environment, we just get all the nurturing right, it's going to solve the problem. No, it's not. Listen, let's do all the nurturing we can, but don't put your hope in the nurturing because there's a resident evil in every single one of us. I know that's not really fun. It's like you're, oh, man, I'm being inspired, Pastor. If you remember storms last weekend, I don't know that I've ever heard so many tornado warnings. I was actually in Omaha on Saturday, like, 20 blocks from where the tornado landed. I was actually in Elkhorn, where the, where the tornado landed. And some of our pastors were there with, with me. And it was, it was crazy, the storms that were going on. 
our nature is like, is like those storms. You know, I'm grateful for Doppler radar, and I'm grateful for all the technology, but with all of mankind's advancements, we still can't control where a tornado falls. Your nature is that way. If you don't have the work of Jesus Christ in your life, you will become a product. And that's a scary thing because that's what science wants to say. You will become evidence for what science tries to say, that you're just a product of your environment. Because your nature, let loose, will wreak havoc. Will, will wreak havoc. You're either the victim of someone's nature or you are the victimizer. Because there's a storm raging within us. Even good people with the greatest intentions are still broken people. At their best, they will leave a legacy filled with flaws and misconceptions. So while Adam's infamy is this bent nature, I'm so glad that Paul didn't stay there. He keeps bringing up Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, and here's an observation, man, from Jesus, we have a human nature that is reclaimed. There's a reclamation taking place. There's a restoration. We've heard the word reconciliation. God wants to reclaim our nature. That's why he's given us righteousness through Jesus Christ. He sent his Holy Spirit to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Go back to the garden story. What happened? They were covered. They felt shame for the first time in their lives. They withdrew from God. They were eventually banished from the garden. Now God, in the restoration of human nature, through the power of his son Jesus Christ and the work he did on the cross and overcoming the grave, now there is hope. There's not only hope, but God wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to do a work with your nature. He wants to bring a thing called purity to your soul and your motives and your thoughts. There's no longer a banishing from the garden. Now he gives you the Holy Spirit who cultivates the fruit of the Spirit. How beautiful, right? He wants you to know what it means to no longer be ruled by your nature, but for now you to understand what it means to triumph over your sin through Jesus Christ. We're going to have the prayer team down here a little later. and I'm going to encourage you, man. There are some things that need to be broken today at all of our campuses, online. There are things that need to be broken because sin is reigning and and we have Christians. They look more like the world because they're, they're allowing their nature to dictate who they are. And I'm telling you, you were made for more. Jesus, man, wants to reclaim the nature. You know, three times in our passage, we're told that sin has reigned over humanity. But not today. Not with the origin story of Jesus Christ. There's a new story that can be narrated. There's a new story that you can be a part of. And I want you to understand something. Man, God hates sin, not because he's some moral prude, not because he doesn't want to grant you the desires of your heart. God hates sin because sin brings death, and death brings destruction to your life and the most most precious relationships you have. Ultimately, separating you even from God. Listen to what Paul says in verse 17. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful, come on, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will, not might be, not maybe, they will try live in what? Triumph over sin and death. But wait a second, Rick, we're all going to die. See, he's referring to more than just a physical death. Man, we are going to not only live forever, but we can live with a quality of life today that's different. Through this one man, who is it? Jesus Christ. When you place your faith in Jesus, God's grace generously is poured out upon you. And it's a gift, and he clothes you in righteousness, and then he empowers you to have triumph over sin. Look what Paul said to the Galatians. I love, it's like we have this new garden. But it's not a physical garden. It's 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 the health of your soul. It's God doing some things with the soil of what you're made of. So look how He speaks of this new fruit in this new garden. 
Chapter 5 of Galatians, verses 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Woo, come on, somebody. Faithfulness, gentleness. And what's that last one? And, and there's no law against these things. No one can stop this. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Notice that last one, self-control. I think restraint is the one thing, like we can, you know, without Jesus, we can involve willpower, and we, we can do a lot of things with willpower and, and effort and discipline, and yet, not in every area. I never met someone that can bring discipline all the way across every area of their life if they're not a Christian. At some point, there's a lack of restraint. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's... it's uh, uh, Abuse with substances. Maybe it's their temper. There's, there's, there's so, see, people have, people have kind of wondered about this for some time. Like, what makes us made in the image of God? What, what is it that reflects the image of God? And some people said, well, it's the ability to reason. And yet, the devil reasoned with the couple in the garden. So I don't know if it's just reasoning is a good example of that. Well, some will say it's that we have a spirit, and that is true. We do. We're a tripartite being. We have a physical body. We have a soul, mind, will, and emotions. Then we have our spirit. So that is definitely true. But what's reflected by that? Could it be that one of the greatest attributes of us reflecting the image of God is our ability to show restraint, to say no to ourselves, to let the Holy Spirit grow this beautiful ability called self-control. God released that among us. I mean, you go back to the Genesis story and the creation story and you see that God creates the, this beautiful place we, we call humanity in the world in six days and on the seventh day, he what? He rests. I mean, God didn't need to rest. He doesn't sleep or slumber. So, but he models rest for us. He, he's, like, he's like that great artist or that great sculptor, sculptor who knows when they don't need to make any more cuts or any more chisels, that it's good. And he can say, enough is enough. And he models restraint. And there's something in the house today where I feel like God is trying to say to you that he's not done with you that you can have victory over sin, that you don't have to become what your nature is or what your family's nature and their heritage has been. You can be your own man, your own woman, who releases the shame of Adam for the glory of God, that you become the glory of God. Hmm. So let's go back to Adam, right? The good stuff's what Jesus gives. But let's just look at Adam. Here's what Adam does. We get this whole mass herding of culture that really owns this. It's where people submit to their own desires. The mantra of our day is, if it feels good, do it. You know, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's not only okay, it's morally right. And and I'm telling you, just because culture says something is morally right doesn't make it morally right. Our moral compass is what the Bible says. And this is what Paul continues to, to bring up when he starts talking about the law. The Bible teaches us. It's a teacher. It's an instructor. It helps us know when our, our flesh is moving in the wrong directions, when our desires become something that's healthy to becoming inordinate. And we all have that capacity I have desires that if I let them run amok, if I let my desires follow their course on, on their own without any restraint, without any ability to say enough is enough, then my desires will consume me. Whether that's lust for another woman or that's greed or it's my own selfishness or it's pride. Or if you have other desires, whether it be for the same sex, whether it be for you to have a nice house, for you to make more money than your family ever did, those desires 
Those desires alone are not sin. But if you let them dictate who you are, they become sin. Temptation alone is not the sin. It's what we do with our temptations. And scriptures tell us that sin is birthed in the heart. It becomes literally alive by us allowing our desires to be what directs us. And this is what's happening in culture today. This is really what's happening with, with human nature. This is happening in the political realm. Everybody's just, man, it doesn't matter. All of a sudden, Christians have become Machiavelli. The ends justify the means. And no, they don't. They never have with Christ. That's our human nature that wants to spin and justify behavior and thoughts and attitudes and desires for our own gain or even for God's gain. We spin it. But that's our nature. God has an upside down kingdom. See, we overestimate the pleasure of sin while underestimating the consequence of our sin. I have a person in my life who over 12 years ago had an affair ended up divorcing his wife 12 years later now his four children have not once engaged in a conversation with him three of the four are married two of those three that are married have children and he's never been with a grandchild and he is so broken See, we, we, we overestimate the pleasure of sin in that moment while underestimating the future consequences, the residue that follows our immorality. And this is why God came to save us. And this really brings back Jesus. See, when Jesus comes part of your origin story, you no longer choose to submit to your desires. You submit to Christ's lordship. Come on. And so I would ask you, you know, are you like the disciples who, Luke 6, I believe it is, Jesus looked to them and, and he said, um, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I ask? See, we have a choice today. Well, my origin story feel more like Adam or will allow my origin story come from Jesus how will my life reflect Adam or Jesus and the choice is ours I'd like to pray for you at this time if you would bow your heads and close your eyes Lord God I would ask you to be with us at each of our congregations I would ask that we would each ask the question will our origin story and our identity come from Adam or from Jesus because you've given us this choice Lord God help us know how to be part of the restoration story the, the reclamation God of your creation oh God we need you and oh God we are so grateful for you God's people agreed and they said amen Make sure to hit that subscribe button below and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel. That way you'll be notified when we post more life-giving messages and go live for our weekend services. Thanks for watching.